Well, this weekend we have a double celebration. Uh, We have the first Holy Communion for uh, seven of our students in Argyle and Hollandale tomorrow. And tomorrow, May 15th, is also our Paternal Feast Day, uh, which we are beginning tonight with tonight's Mass. So a great double celebration for our parish this weekend. And by the way, if you weren't paying attention last week, uh, that is why we have some uh, reception after Mass. So you can join us for... Um, you know, a drink, not that kind of drink, uh, and some uh, food back there uh, in honor of our uh, feast day uh, for St. Isidore. And it's important for us to continuously think about the Eucharist as we think about our First Holy Communion students, what it means, how we respond to it, and since it is the central truth of our faith, It is the source and summit of our faith. It is the unique, singular gift given to us by Christ himself so that we will always have him with us. Why is the Eucharist so important? Well, we should always turn to Scripture, and especially the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, arguably the most important chapter of all of Scripture. Jesus Christ himself says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. God tells us unequivocally, without question, the Eucharist, which is his body and blood, is the source of eternal life in heaven, and we cannot reach heaven without receiving the Eucharist. Remember that in that chapter, when he is questioned, he doubles down on this eternal truth. When some of his disciples leave because they cannot believe what he is saying, Jesus does not change what he is saying, but because truth never changes. Now I want us to think about the words we use. When you come forward to receive communion, either I or the extraordinary minister says, the body of Christ. And your response is, amen. It shouldn't be anything else. Definitely shouldn't be thank you. These words we hear and say every week have profound meaning. First, we we say the body of Christ. This is the belief that every Catholic needs to have. Communion is not a symbol. It is not like the body of Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ, God himself, truly is present in the Eucharist. What used to be just bread is now truly the body of Christ. Heaven has touched earth. God has made himself present and offers himself to you. And your response is amen. You may know this is a Hebrew word that means truth. So when you say amen, you are agreeing that what you are receiving is the body and blood of Christ. I'm going to stress this. If you do not believe that, you should not receive the Eucharist. To do so would be to receive God unworthily. And this is another important concept, receiving the Eucharist worthily. In one sense, none of us is worthy to receive our Lord in the Eucharist. This is why we repeat the words of the centurion, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the words and my soul shall be healed. So how do we become worthy to receive the Eucharist? We must be free of all attachment to sin. One good thing is that at the beginning of every Mass, We are absolved of all venial sin. 
Those are the words of absolution following the Kyrie, which, of course, we didn't do this morning because of the sprinkling rite. But in any case, most masses, I, the priest, will say, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. That absolution does not, however, forgive any mortal sins. We must go to sacramental confession, confession with a priest, to be absolved of mortal sins. Now, it would be impossible for me to mention every mortal sin now, but we should all remember that missing Sunday, missing Mass on Sunday or Saturday evening or any other holy day of obligation without a good excuse like illness is a mortal sin. So if you miss any Sunday without a legitimate reason, and by the way, traveling and sports are not legitimate reasons, you must go to confession before you receive communion again. Now, I often hear, where is that in the Bible? Well, we can turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment or condemnation. On himself. So again, we must all examine our conscience before we attend Mass. If we realize that we are not worthy to receive our Lord, then we should not receive Eucharist. If we do receive the Eucharist unworthily, then we are bringing condemnation upon ourselves. This is serious stuff, the most serious. This is infinitely more serious than work, school, and certainly sports, even baseball. It literally does not get more serious and important than the Eucharist. Please remember that being worthy to receive the Eucharist includes observing the Eucharistic fast. And this is something that I have observed and I want to correct now. The Code of Canon Law, which we are all bound to as Catholics, says that one who is to receive the Most Holy Eucharist is to abstain from any food or drink, with the exception of water and medicine, for at least the period of one hour before Holy Communion. This is a tradition going back to the earliest church. And in fact, it used to be that a Catholic would observe that fast from midnight to until receiving Holy Communion that day. But like so many things, our laws have been weakened so that it is now only one hour. That's really not too much to ask. Please note, and this is the problem that I have observed, this includes gum. Please, please do not chew gum in church. Not only is it breaking the Eucharistic fast, It's just inappropriate in church. Again, you may ask, why do we observe a Eucharistic fast? Well, part of it has to do with the inherent good of penance and fasting. These are meant to draw us closer to God, to remind us of our humble reliance on God. The fast is meant to create a physical hunger and thirst, as well as a spiritual hunger and thirst for our Lord. We fast so that we do not spoil our appetite, but increase it to share in the communal feast. St. Thomas Aquinas supplements with two reasons. Now keep in mind that when he wrote this, the fast was from midnight. First, we fast out of respect for the sacrament, 
so that our Lord enters a mouth not yet contaminated by food or drink. This is similar to the reason why our first words every morning should be a prayer to God. Second, we fast to remember the significance of the Eucharist and that we should always put God first. As we hear in the Gospel of Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God. In essence, the fast is meant to help us humbly to prepare to receive our Lord, body and soul, in the Eucharist. And there's one more important word that we should always remember when it comes to God and the Eucharist. Humility. We should always approach our Lord humbly. We should show humility first by always genuflecting, unless we physically cannot, when we pass in front of the tabernacle outside of Mass. It used to be that any time a man passed in front of a church, a Catholic church, he would take his hat off, recognizing that the Eucharist was inside. And I've heard other Catholics talk about any time they pass in front of a Catholic church, they say a prayer for the priest who consecrated the Eucharist that's in that tabernacle. We show humility at the time of Holy Communion by how we approach the reception of our Lord. Remember that we should start with our demeanor in the communion line. This is not a line to enter a movie theater or to get on a ride at at an amusement park. And then we continue by remembering to bow, a simple head bow, when the person in front of us is receiving communion and before we step forward. And we finally show humility and respect by how we receive our Lord. The preference, note the word preference, always is that we receive by kneeling and on the tongue. Kneeling is an act of humility. And receiving on the tongue assures that no particles of our Lord are spread around. Remember that even the smallest particle of the Eucharist is fully God. Now, I'm not saying that you must receive kneeling and on the tongue. So please don't report that I'm saying that. I'm simply saying that this is the preferred way, and it always has been throughout the history of the church. If you choose to receive standing or you cannot kneel, please do so in a respectful manner, not slouching and not, and this really bothers me, with one foot already planted to walk away as quickly as possible. If you receive on the hand, unless you physically cannot, please remember to receive in your hand with both making a throne. When I was preparing for First Holy Communion, they always told us to place our dominant hand underneath so that we can pick it up the Eucharist with our dominant hand and place it in our mouth. Do not snatch the Holy Communion. If you do happen to have particles of our Lord in your hand, please do not just wipe them off, but discreetly consume them. There is a profound image you may have seen around of our Lord bloody on the cross, lying on the floor with people walking on him oblivious. This is what happens when we do not treat Holy Communion with the proper respect and humility. Now, there's so much more that can can and should be said about our proper respect for Holy Communion. We can never say too much because, as I said at the beginning, it is the central aspect of our faith, the source and summit of everything that we are. The Eucharist is the greatest gift that we can be given, and we should always remember that. If we truly love and appreciate the Eucharist as we should, we would recognize these rules about the Eucharist and the Mass, not as rules that we are being forced to follow, but rather helpful guides for us to be better sons and daughters of God. Remember that God's rules are not burdens, but are given to help us to grow closer to him and to ultimately share an eternal life with him. 
Now, since this weekend is the Feast of St. Isidore, our patron saint, I want to briefly mention how, we can, how he can help us better love our Lord in the Eucharist. Every saint, and I think I can say that without fear of being uh, shown differently, every saint has had a devotion to the Eucharist. It's part of how they became saints, and St. Isidore was no exception. You may know that he was a farmer in 12th century Spain. He is the patron saint of farmers, which is why he was chosen for our parish. Even though he was extremely busy as a farmer, as many of you know well, well know, he made sure to start every day with mass and extra time in prayer at church. No amount of work would stop him. And there are two great stories that emphasize this. First, it's said that when he was at Mass and praying at church, angels worked the field for him. And second, some of his fellow farmers complained to the landlord, who actually owned the fields, that he was spending too much time at church. So the landlord came one day to see for himself, and sure enough, while the other farmers were in their fields, Isidore was nowhere to be found. Then all of a sudden, he saw three plows in Isidore's field. As the landlord approached, two disappeared, and only St. Isidore was left. When the landlord asked what happened, Isidore said he was the only one there. He said he never asked anyone to help him except God. So the landlord realized that the angels were helping him, and that he didn't need to bother him again since St. Isidore was getting more work done than the other farmers anyways. Now, I can't promise you that angels will come and work your farms for you. But I can promise you that if you put God and the Eucharist first, he will reward you in this life or the next. So today, as always, as we prepare to receive the Eucharist, we give thanks to God for his gift of salvation for us. We give thanks for his food for everlasting life. We give thanks for our First Communion students. And we give thanks for the humble example of our patron, St. Isidore. And we humbly repeat our responsorial psalm today. I will praise your name forever, my King and my God.